So we can begin. So hello to all. Welcome to our another talks of our episode. We have got Benito here. And we, before we begin, Benito, why not uh, introduce yourself to us? What do you exactly do, and why are you here? Yes. Yeah, so hello, everyone. My name is Benito Wainwright, and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Bristol in the biology department. And my main area of interest is a field which we call visual ecology, which is essentially how animals see the world and why they see the world given the ecological conditions that they experience and i spend most of my time studying the visual ecology of a, quite an amazing group of butterflies um, native to the amazon rainforest um, which i'm sure we'll speak about in a little bit more detail later but yeah i'm a butterfly person as well <laughs> So how many years have you been doing this, Victor? Is, is it a very long time or is it just the, like, was it your interest actually when you came into this? Or you just found your way into butterflies? Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I've always been interested in nature. I wouldn't say I've always been interested, specifically interested in butterflies per se. So it was more kind of the, the general research question that interested me. And it just turned, it just so happens that butterflies are a really, really good study system for studying evolutionary and sensory biology um, but i have to say since starting the phd so i've been doing the phd for ooh, a year and a half now um, but since i've started i think i have noticed that i have become particularly obsessed with butterflies i have grown a bit of a soft spot for them and i think that's showcased in the various videos and things i post on social media there's definitely a butterfly bias now but um, yeah, it never used to be that way. I used to just love life generally, and I still do, obviously. <laughs> but I guess I have a particular fondness for butterflies now. So, Beda, what was what do you think is extraordinary about butterflies? They think, yeah, as I said, I kept my butterfly specimens under a microscope. I already knew their their wing structures, but then again, I was I was fascinated by by the wing structures they have. And of course, the you know the uh, our impacts on butterflies. So, what do you think? Why are butterflies so cool creatures? Let's say. I think there's multiple reasons. Actually, I think one of the main reasons is that they're one of those creatures which capture the imagination from a very young age. It's one of those activities which so many kids do when they're younger. You know, rearing caterpillars and then watching that incredible, miraculous metamorphosis process happening before their eyes. I think it's one of these. You know, it is one of nature's greatest spectacles that's happening right in everyone's back gardens. Um, so I think that sort of thing captures the imagination, sparks a lot of biologists' interests in, in, in the natural world, well, a lot of young people's interests, and therefore en end up becoming biologists. Um, other reasons, well, they're very pretty. <laughs> they have absolutely remarkably diverse coloration, and. The reasons why um, that coloration has evolved and why it's adaptive is obviously of great interest to biologists, but also it's something which captures the imagination and has been, you know, depicted in, in culture through through the centuries. Um, so that's what interests me. And then at a more specific level, um, as a visual ecologist, butterflies have really interesting visual systems as well. Um, in fact, their, their visual systems are almost as diverse as their color patterns. So there's all sorts of amazing reasons as to why butterflies are, are cool. <laughs> so, you know, why, well, of course, I believe some of them are used for camouflage, some of them are, you know, their colors are used for, you know, showing the pets that are not good, nice to eat. And some are actually, you know, mimicking those ones which are not saying that I'm nice, not nice to eat. So what do you think, how are those colors formed in the first place? How are all these, you know, extraordinary, let's say, the, the plates and all those unique wing structures formed when the butterfly is turning into a caterpillar. That is a question I think it is battling everyone's minds. Yeah, so colour can be produced in a variety of different ways in butterflies. Um, but the main two ways, if you like, are through pigmented colour. So this is um, colour created by 
the absorption of particular pigments which are found in, in the scales of these butterflies. So if you look at, in fact, you've taken some really nice photos, but if you zoom in at the butterfly's wing, you see all these different scales and those scales contain different pigments which absorb different wavelengths of light. And that's commonly um, seen in the kind of reddish and orange butterflies. You don't, uh, Red and orange pigments tend to be particularly common. If you were to look at certain blue butterflies, actually, that blue is created not through pigmented colour, it's created th through something which we call structural coloration. And that's um, when it starts to get a little bit physics-y. So that colour is created just by the different structures, the little nanostructures in the butterfly wings and how they reflect and refract the light and diffract the light as well, all sorts of weird optics going on there. But those wings don't actually contain any blue pigment per se. Um, so using those two different mechanisms, um, you get this incredible diversity of, of colors and patterns in, in the butterfly world. It's really um, quite remarkable. And the actual kind of developmental processes <coughs> which lead to those different colors and pans are extremely complex and we're only just beginning to kind of scratch the surface really on how how all these colors are created and as you mentioned how um adaptive they are whether they're used for camouflage whether they're used for mimicry whether they're used um, for attracting mates basically color is really important for butterflies so yeah they're using it in a, in a multitude of different ways no, it, it is quite extraordinary, you know, I have, I have not seen much of species of butterflies that you have, let's say, researched and worked on. But then I've seen small butterflies and, and, and large ones, let's say, a lot lamp butterfly. And, and they are seemingly extraordinary. But apart, you know, from the, their colors, emphasizing our eyes, what is the main function of these scales and the tiny hair structures on their wings that helps them to fly? Um, what, well, to help them to fly, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the scales don't really help them to fly per se. As I say, that's mainly used for communication and, well, sometimes to hide from predators in terms of camouflage. It's more the, the kind of structure of the wing itself, which, as you can see, I mean, when you compare it to other insects, is extremely kind of exaggerated. Like, um, the, the wings of butterflies are much bigger than other insects, but actually they function in, in exactly the same way so you've got the kind of hind wings which help in kind of maneuvering the the butterfly and changing shape and then the main forewings to help and aid in proper propulsion to push the the butterfly forward um in order to explain the ins and outs i'd probably have to deep deep dig deep into the physics books again i'm afraid so i don't know um too much about that that side of things but um it's an extremely important and conserves way of flying about which is the same across all all insects really they all kind of use the same kind of physical principles um because they've all evolved those wings from the same um common ancestor i guess but um yeah that's another kettle of fish <laughs> that i'm not really that involved in but yeah it's a it's interesting I, question. I actually read a book about about the same the saying that those structures you know catch the wind so i'm able to fly in a very you know sweet manner because they, they said they can't fly without their scales there's going to be too much of a flood fluffing them now Brita, yeah. what do you think what is extraordinary about butterflies like um, people look at butterflies only see their colors is there anything let's say their brain or anything that is beyond that you know that that beauty that is you know particularly if you're interested in, say? yeah that's true but yeah going back to what you were saying earlier though that the the larger wings of butterflies you're absolutely right because if you have a larger butterfly wing, that helps the butterfly because it means it doesn't have to flap as much. So some butterflies with really, really large wings could just get by just by floating in the air and just flapping their wings occasionally. Um, but yeah, yeah. going back to your other question, is there any other thing, something else which is cool about butterflies? Yes, so I spend a lot of my time studying butterfly brains, um, which is a really interesting way of studying butterfly behavior. Because if you think about it, any behavior by any animal um, if you really want to understand how those behaviors arise and how they evolve you could do a lot worse than looking at the brain because ultimately it's the brain which controls these behaviors 
And yeah, butterflies, I mean, they're extremely diverse. We've got like 180,000 different species. So each one of those species has a slightly different kind of personality. Um, but there's one very special group of butterflies that my research group studies. Um, there's a native um, to kind of tropical rainforest in Central and South America. And they're a group of butterflies called the Heliconius. And they are a very popular insect species to study for a multitude of reasons because there's all sorts of interesting things um, about their biology that make them really good model organisms to study. But the reason why my research group studies them is an intelligent insect, let's say. So the way we measure intelligence in insects is by looking at an area of the insect brain called the mushroom body um, and it's called the mushroom body because it's shaped a little bit like a mushroom um, but basically what the mushroom body is thought to be involved in is spatial learning and memory um, so when you think about it you know learning and memory are tend to be things that we associate with intelligence obviously in the word intelligence is very subjective but we'll use it in this context okay um, and what we found is that the mushroom bodies of these heliconius butterflies are absolutely enormous compared to other butterflies or compared to other insects relative to the rest of the brain volume um, and obviously the bigger a structure is that would suggest the more useful it is for the organism in question so there must be a reason why these butterflies have such large mushroom bodies and this is still a work in progress we haven't still we haven't cracked the the question the, the problem yet but what seems to be the best hypothesis for explaining this is because of their diet so these heliconius butterflies are unique in that they feed on pollen um so most butterflies that you see feed on nectar of flowers and they just happen to pollinate the flowers just by you know passing on the pollen on its proboscis but these butterflies actually feed on the pollen itself um, and what why that's relevant is because this pollen contains loads of really useful amino acids that are thought to kind of increase the longevity of the butterfly in other words how long they live for and if you live for longer the life becomes slightly more worth remembering, if you like, because I mean, these butterflies can live up to, you know, nine to 12 months in the wild, even longer in captivity, I think. So that's pretty long lived for a butterfly. Um, and so therefore kind of evolution has selected for kind of bigger brains in these butterflies to help them remember things. And the key thing that they have to remember actually is where that food is okay because the the plants that these butterflies are picky about what they eat they only feed on specific flowers right and those flowers are kind of clumps across the rainforest in which they live so in order to know where to go and where to forage these butterflies need to remember where these specific flowers are so that's why they've evolved well, that's why we think they've evolved these large mushroom bodies to remember the precise location of each of these food plants so that means every day when they wake up in the morning they go around they spend their day going round each of these food plants in a set order each time um and then coming back together in a communal route in the evening and so that's yeah it's this really unique behavior that to our knowledge we haven't seen in any other butterfly group before i mean there's still a lot to be discovered of course but yeah it's a really unique study system so yeah uh, butterflies are really intelligent as well <laughs> so that's probably exactly a long answer, like, yeah. when we think of butterflies you know we think of okay this this creature is only meant you know to fly but we don't understand that there is a brain behind all this mm -hmm. and it's really exciting so it's so as you mentioned that mm -hmm. means butterflies are not you know only dependent on smell to find the flowers or something like that right mm -hmm. so the, and so this, this butterfly lives longer than the other butterflies as well because it's feeding on more amino acid rich uh, pollen. Yeah. And so, so according to you said, the 
flowers are not found that often. So I think a deforestation is going to be a very impactful thing for the for these butterflies. Apart from that, Benito, what do you mean in, in a global scale? What do you think? What are the main threats butterflies are, are facing? You know, globally. Um. Yes. Very good question. Um. A multitude of, of things, really. Um, the main one, which is obviously always said first, is climate change. Um, climate change can have all sorts of overriding impacts on the distribution of butterflies and also, more importantly, the distribution of their host plants and also the distribution of their food plants. So the host plant is what the larvae, the caterpillars, feed on and the food plant is, is, is the nectar, um, a ne nectar which flowers which the adults feed on. Um, so, if climate change is affecting the distribution of those, then that will cause a shift in the, how the butterflies are distributed. And depending on how quickly they can evolve and adapt, um, will affect how successful they are. The other thing um, about butterflies is that many species undergo quite impressive migration. So, you may have heard of the um, migration of the monarch butterfly, for example, which migrates all the way from Canada to a particular pine forest in central Mexico. Um, so when you're considering the kind of conservation of a species, you've got to consider well what's happening in both locations and what's happening, obviously, these Mexican pine forests are becoming increasingly threatened by kind of deforestation, and stuff like that, um, which is a disaster if you've got a species which is so specific, so reliant on that area. Um, but there are other threats as well, of course, so things like pesticides, um, which are killing off host plants, things like that in agriculture, um, all sorts of factors. Uh, yeah, when you add them all together, it doesn't bode very well for, for butterfly conservation um, generally. But, you know, the more we understand, the more, the better informed decisions we'll be able to make, hopefully. So, no, Benito, of course, I've also seen, you know, some, like people, let's say, such as, uh, who, are, who love their plants a lot, you know, and we don't blame them. So when they see a butterfly, they have got this very, very huge sort of thing, which they hate it a bit, because of things that they lay their eggs on it, and they cannot afford to eat the plant. So, to the, all the farmers and the plant lovers out there, what message do you have? Let's say, do you think, you know, butterflies are more beneficial to a plant or more deadly for it, you know, that the cannibals of it and just eat it? Well, my top tip is whenever you're kind of wanting to make your garden more wildlife friendly, is to have a section of your garden which is left to grow wild. So have a little bit of, have some weeds growing. Because actually, the host plants, so what the caterpillars feed on and what the adults feed on, tend to be different. So you can, you can theoretically attract loads of nice butterflies to your garden and then not worry about the caterpillars and leave, <laughs> leave the butterflies to lay their eggs somewhere else that's not your garden. Um, because they tend to feed on, on different things. Um, but yeah, I would say that the best thing you can do is just to dedicate a little small space in your garden to growing things well <clears throat> if you live in the UK there's a weed here that we call the stinging nettle uh, <clears throat> and it stings it stings you when you put your hand on it so it's not a very nice <laughs> plant to have but so many species of butterfly larvae like it it's kind of the sort of chicken nuggets of, of the caterpillar world they animals you know they, they absolutely love it um, so if you can leave a small section of your garden for like weeds like that then that will hopefully help um, uh, yeah, the amount of butterflies that you'll have later on in the year um, feeding on your other on the other plants that you grow um, so yeah you've got to be a little bit picky you, I mean there are some species of plants which you know might very well get absolutely ravaged by caterpillars so you've got to choose and do your research on what plants you want to grow in your garden because the last thing you want to be doing is putting down pesticides or pellets or anything like that because that will have um, damaging consequences into the whole food chain not just the butterflies um, 
but you know you've got to remember it's very important to have butterflies in your garden they're incredibly good pollinators they're doing incredibly good things for our for our planet for our plant life because essentially what they are they're like are like little farmers if you like there you can think of the kind of bees and butterflies as sort of farming um the future generations of plants in a, in a weird way in a kind of evolutionary context i suppose so yeah they're, they're very important <laughs> now Benita, what 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 message do you have because you know this is really important for me you know if, if i'm going to be a future biologist let's say reinvent yourself if we don't take action today for let's say climate change or deforestation or all these you know impacts happening due to human activity we cannot save the natural world so what do you think each and every single one of us as individuals can do to help butterflies you know because it is it is really devastating. They're the most important pollinators we have. As you can say, they're not only having wonderful colors, but they do wonderful things, like the monarch butterflies migrating or the butterfly eating the, the, the pollen grains. That that's just extraordinary. So what what do you think we all can do as individuals to save them? Yeah, I mean there are so many things that you can do now. Um specifically for butterflies, there are loads of really good butterfly related charities. So in the UK there's a um, a charity called Butterfly Conservation, which is very aptly named. Um, I've got a video coming out um, with them later this next week, I think, actually. So, yeah, they, they have loads of really, really good tips and you can become a member and make regular donations and essentially just helping butterfly conservation in the UK generally. The UK are really good um, for this sort of thing, I suppose, for their citizen science. I think we're the kind of leaders in citizen science in the world probably because we've got things like big garden bird watchers where everyone in the country gets their binoculars out and counts birds in their gardens exactly the same for butterflies um so those things but on a grander scale if you think about you know just helping the planet generally then i guess the main things you can do are sort of um what you hear a lot in the media so the first thing would be to cut down on meat consumption um that's not to say necessarily go completely vegetarian but you know the less meat we consume um the less kind of land is 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 wasted and less is and deforested etc the kind of region it's, it's something which isn't really explained i don't to a full, full enough extent sometimes. So that's one thing um, that will massively kind of cut down your carbon emissions. And the second thing, I suppose, is just to be more conscious about um, when you're being wasteful and when you're kind of you're basically just being conscious of your carbon footprint, I suppose. So, you know, going on long haul flights, you know, traveling and flying a lot is. Uh, for a really really good way of um of, help, of helping the environment so it's just being aware of it and, and being conscious of it um obviously you know we all like to travel and we all like to have a good time so we don't want to impede on any of that but um just always kind of just going through your day-to-day -day life and think about how could i make this as sort of eco-friendly as possible um without while still enjoying your life because i feel like some people are <laughs> kind of put off by um what they see on social media because they um, but uh, yeah there's so many ways things we can do I want to ask you what do you think they say you know you have got the right way to hold the butterfly and a wrong way you know especially children who want to take a close look at it we don't want to hurt the animal so what do you think it should, what is the right way to hold the butterfly let's say for curious children who want to do it what's the right way to hold a butterfly that's a good question i mean i should state actually it's quite a pressing scenario so i'm one and a half years into my phd at the moment and i still haven't seen i haven't worked on a live butterfly yet <laughs> um well, obviously my the plan was to go into the field um to ecuador um last september to do some field work obviously that was all cancelled because of covid um but actually I, I do have ordered some pupae and I should actually be have some live butterflies in a couple of weeks time which is very exciting but from my other previous experience of working with butterflies I, I would say the best thing to do is just not to handle them at all really because they're so delicate um, and the scales 
I think you're often told if you touch the scales, then you're kind of killing the butterfly in a sense. I mean, what you're doing is you're rubbing the scales off, which doesn't necessarily affect their flight that much, um, but it will affect their ability to kind of camouflage themselves potentially or to attract mates or to ward off the predators so in that sense you're kind of reducing their survivability i think the best thing you can do is just not to hold them by the wings if you've got a really docile butterfly on a piece of grass and you, you can gradually let it crawl up to your your hand and have it on there you know unrestrained and that's a, a lovely moment but that i would still i would you know strongly encourage young people to just keep caterpillars and watch them metamorphose because that is one of the most the greatest kind of special spectacles that you can you can ever witness anywhere in the world i would say so yeah having a caterpillar on the palm of your hand is, is definitely something which kind of has inspired many a biologist i think many a future biologist um so yeah but observe at the distance what you, generally what do you think of let's say the, the work that i do you know all the all these videos and spreading awareness what do you think is that impactful what do you think of the work i do well, yeah, that's great, actually. I should have mentioned that in my answer to your previous question. <laughs> but yes, science communication, education is very important. Connecting people with um, that nature again, because the reason why I think a lot of people aren't conscious, and, uh, you know, going back to what I was saying before about being aware of your impact on the environment and day-to-day -day activities, is because people have lost that connection with nature. Um, you know, where many of us live in bustling cities where it doesn't feel like there's much nature around, everything's so busy, everything's all go. Even I feel that sometimes. You know, a PhD is quite an intense thing to be doing. There are times where I actually realize, God, I haven't actually had a walk out in nature in a long time. Um, so <laughs> um, it's easy to kind of get trapped into to modern day life. But, you know, just spending a, some time out in nature really provides an incredible escapism. And science communication really helps with that because, you know, sometimes, you know, if I've had a, a, a tough day or, you know, an intense day, just scrolling through my Instagram feed and seeing all these lovely nature uh, pictures really kind of makes a, a huge difference to my mood and mental health. So, yeah, science communication is really important and to kind of increase the sort of clarity and, and, and truth in science. I think one thing that this pandemic has taught us is that there are people out there who are a bit skeptical of science so i think we we need to shout about it more than ever um so yeah it's very very important and that's why i i feel um like doing science communication on instagram and on youtube is is, is really kind of important and fulfilling as well when you see people commenting and enjoying your stuff really? So Benito, thank you so much for joining this uh, Nature Talks today. Uh, yeah, check his YouTube account, uh, YouTube account out. It's amazing. I watch many of his videos as well as his Instagram. He gives quite tips, you know, of butterflies' brains and different, different, you know, fields in biology, and it is amazing. So check out Benito explains, and uh, thank you for joining Nature Talks today, where learning becomes conservation. Thank you very much.